Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to you all. Uh, welcome to the first session of the introduction to modern Indian drama. This is again Dr. Kiran Keshamurthy and I will be offering this 20 hour lecture course this uh, semester for January to May. Um, to begin with, right, we need to try and understand this phenomenon of modern Indian drama. Right? Where does it come from? Why is it called modern? What makes modern Indian drama modern? If you look at the early history of modern Indian drama, uh, it, a lot of it comes from the encounter with the colonial regime, the British. Right? And uh, in the early histories of Indian theatre, right, by Horace Heyman Wilson's three-volume Select Specimens of the Theatre of the Hindus, published in 1827 in Calcutta, and Sylvain Levy's two-volume, The Indian Theatre, right? you will notice that a lot of what came to be understood as modern Indian theatre was the product of the cultural uh, encounter between the British and the Indian natives. Right? Uh, a lot of the early scholarship, the early understanding of modern Indian theatre uh, came from, was clearly influenced by Orientalism, right? which became a style of thought, a style of stereotyping. The East as, in this case, Sanskritic, right? Aryan, Sanskritic, and so on. Right? And a lot of the uh, scholarship that was produced earlier by colonial missionaries, colonial scholars, orientalist scholars, Indologists, uh, equated Indian theatre with Sanskrit theatre. They assumed that all of Indian theatre was a product of the, what they call the classical Sanskritic tradition of music, dance and performance. And this was done at the cost of dismissing the very multilingual nature of Indian theatre be it Sanskrit or even non-Sanskritic forms of theatre and performance. Right. Um, if you look at the colonial historiography of Indian theatre, it, in, in, and of course by historiography I mean the way the histories of Indian theatre were written at the cost of excluding other histories, other categories. Right. So if you look at the colonial histori historiography of Indian theatre, it clearly follows Western chronological categories of ancient, medieval, and modern. Where ancient theater was equated with Sanskrit theater, which la lasted roughly from 200 BCE to 1000 BCE. Medieval or traditional theater, which lasted from 1000 CE to the present. And modern theater, which lasted from the late 18th century to the present. And in these categorizations, there was an assumption that Indian theatre could be equated with Sanskrit theatre, right? with the aesthetic performative traditions of Sanskrit theatre. And Sanskrit theatre itself was modelled on the ancient text, the Nati Shastra by Bharata. It was, the, the Nati Shastra was an ancient text on dramaturgy, which provided copious data on theoretical and practical aspects of theatre from acting and dancing to music and prosody, the sizes and shapes of playhouses, costumes and makeup, theories of emotions and sentiments, and even requirements of, for critics and audiences and so on. Right? So it was actually a very, very technical, uh, prescriptive text, right? which laid down the rules, the norms, the rules and regulations of performance. Right? 
And of course, these perform early performances were not, strictly speaking, only uh, did not involve just acting, right? but also involved a great deal of music and performance and dance. One of the earliest Sanskrit plays to be translated and studied by Orientalist missionaries and scholars were, of course, Kalidasa's or Abhignana Shakuntala, right? which, of course, was the story of Shakuntala. And um, it was translated by the missionary scholar William Jones and published in Calcutta in 1789. But this play, and I think in the process of translating the play, what was very conveniently forgotten was the fact that this play was not just in Sanskrit. It was also in many other languages, like Shauraseni, Maharashtri, and Magadhi. The other you know, early play that was to be translated and studied uh, and, and uh, disseminated was Shudraka's Mrichakatika, which translates as the little clay cot, which again comprised of many of the languages which were lost in translation. Right? So the whole uh, politics of translation comes here, where in the process of translating these early texts, missionary scholars uh, and uh, later on even students began to believe that these early plays were purely in Sanskrit, which is not true. Right? So the assumption that these colonial missionaries were making and, and a lot of the theories on Indian theater that the colonial missionaries and scholars came up with was also borrowed and incorporated into a lot of, uh, by a lot of Indian uh, theoreticians and practitioners of theater. Right? Um, what many of them actually forget is that this tradition of performance in theater was not an uninterrupted essential tradition right? from the age of Sanskrit theater to the uh, mid or the late 18th century. Right? There were a lot of other local native performative traditions, especially folk performances right? in pre-colonial India which also overlapped a lot with dance and music. Right? But many of these traditions, I'm talking about these local regional traditions of dance and folk dance and theater and music, were dismissed or overlooked by colonial scholars as crude and low forms of performance art. Right? Colonial era theater drew largely on Western conventions of theater in terms of lighting and scenography, while shunning these local forms of theater as crude. But there was a turn back to pre-modern Sanskritic models of theater, which came to be revalued as classical because of certain nationalist aspirations. So there were a lot of uh, uh, early Indian all-male playwrights and practitioners of theater who looked back to Sanskrit theater as uh, models of Indian slash Hindu performative culture. Right? So there was an attempt to try and build an Indian nation, especially in the wake of the freedom struggle, that was both traditional and modern, right? through a return to Hindu Puranic traditions. Thus the creation of Indianness of what came to be called as Indianness was a very political issue. And what enabled this equation of Sanskritic uh, theater with uh, Indian, modern Indian theater, right, was of course, as I mentioned earlier, the establishment of Indology in the mid 18th century, right, um, as a field of scholarship that uh, presented the value that Sanskrit texts had, uh, both religious as well as secular texts had to European scholars. Right? And a lot of the understanding that European scholars had of India's ancient past was also being borrowed and incorporated by many of the early Indian playwrights and practitioners of theater. Even later histories of Indian theater, like Hemindranath Das Gupta's four volume, The Indian Stage, which was published in Calcutta between 1944 and 1946, and Ra Raman Lal Kanailal Yagnik's The Indian Theatre, 
did not acknowledge the presence of other theater performance traditions in India. Many of these later histories of Indian theater were written after independence, but continue to emphasize the lasting importance of Sanskrit theater on Indian theater. And of course, the irony was that many actors did not have a sense of these Western conventions of theater acting. Right? Because it's not like as though the local uh, traditions, local uh, folk traditions of theater were completely forgotten or uh, uh, superseded by uh, colonial Western models of theater. Right? I think a lot of these uh, conventions of um, theatrical acting, be it dance and performance and music, right, were incorporated, incorporated by these actors uh, into what became modern Indian drama. Right? So modern Indian theatre became a confluence of uh, Western models of uh, theatre, especially in terms of a certain kind of naturalist realism in terms of scenography, the fact that you could have um, uh, shifting uh, backdrops right, uh, behind the actors on stage, which signified different scenes, or lighting, the fact that you have lighting uh, instead of using natural light. All these things were incorporated into modern Indian drama, along with many local traditions of dance, and sing and music, right? And you see this in the ways in which many of our local uh, regional traditions of performance like Yakshagana or Jatra right, uh, were of course meant to be performed out in natural surroundings, right? They were itinerant or traveling troops who performed night after night to uh, a varied uh, maybe largely rural audience right, uh, across different towns and villages. That was a very different scene, let's say, than from the idea of modern Indian theater, right, um, designed on Western models of theater, which were being performed in what is, what is known as the proscenium theater. Right? The proscenium is this raised stage in an enclosed space. Right? So the actors who are actually on stage become the subject of a spectacle. Right? It's a spectacular sight to be able to see them perform by the audience. Right? So it's no longer a performance which is being performed at, let's say, the, uh, the, the eye level of uh, the, uh, the audience who's watching, right? but it becomes a raised platform in an enclosed space. So this is, there's a certain degree of intimacy and privacy that's, in, that's, that's associated with um, Western modeled Indian theater, right? And it was under the rule of the East India Company, right? Where, when you had the early playhouses being set up in Calcutta, because Calcutta was their first capital. In 1775 was Calcutta Theatre. In 1813 came up the Chauringi Theatre, the Sans Souci Theatre in 1839, which were all patronized by colonial officials. So when, uh, when um, colonial theatre was first performed in these playhouses, it was not meant for the common masses. Right? It was largely an elite form of entertainment and art, performance art which was not open to everyone. And they were also patronized by colonial officials, right? And as well as the uh, native elite, right? Uh, these native elite comprised of uh, the Parsis, right? mostly the Parsis, who had benefited from the advantages of colonial education. They also dressed up in a fairly westernized fashion. And they owned many businesses they owned many of these uh, theater production houses, right? And they also uh, sponsored uh, these uh, theater productions, right? So in some sense, they also had connections with uh, a lot of these British 
uh, officers and, and, and the East India Company. So it became theater under the British, became a commercialized event. It became a ticketed event. So um, it was only in the late 19th century that theater spread as a form of mass entertainment in Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras, and then to schools and colleges. Theater, as I said earlier, became a commercial ticketed event, and there was now a new distinction between the actor manager and the director. Right? So initially, you had an actor who was also the manager of the, the troupe, the, and he managed the funds and the, 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 the performance spaces and so on. But now you also had a director, a director who was autonomous, who didn't necessarily act in the play, but was uh, able to direct the play and create perhaps a certain kind of uh, performance aesthetic. So in some sense, the phenomenon of modern Indian theater uh, represents an unprecedented historical transition from uh, the early days of Sanskrit theater, because it became a highly institutionalized and commercial performance art. Uh, it, was, it was institutionalized through these playhouses. Uh, it was institutionalized in terms of uh, having several crew members who were engaged with lighting and makeup and costumes. Uh, you had uh, professional actors who had to be trained in these conventions of acting, who were also paid actors. They performed in these highly intimate, enclosed spaces. Right? Uh, they were also ticketed events. And you also had the circulation of texts, lots of texts. These plays were transcribed, transmitted, written, published right, as printed books that could be read and disseminated. And it's because of this that modern Indian theater became institutionalized in a way that it, it, had, it had never been before. But it's also, it's also important to remember that the mere importation of the proscenium theater did not modernize Indian theater. Indian theater in the 1770s was still an elite form of entertainment that was limited to small British populations in the three presidency cities or towns then of Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta. The early plays that were staged in the latter decades of the 18th century addressed social issues like polygamy, child marriage, opium addiction, faith-sanctioned violence, the plight of Indian women, and so on. The most famous play, or perhaps infamous play, to be banned was Dinabandh Mitra's Neel Darpan, which was a very polemical attack on the exploitative British indigo planters. Because the whole pl uh, the plantation of indigo, the mass uh, monoculture of indigo in Bengal had actually caused uh, widespread poverty and famine and disease. So this was a play that directly attacked the exploitative policies of British planters. And it was then banned as seditious, as going against the British state, Indian state. And this play, in some sense, was crucial in precipitating the passing of the Dramatic Performances Act in 1876 to curb seditious and patriotic tendencies. Theatre scholar Anandalal argues that Rabindranath Tagore, right, who was born in 1861 and dies in 1941, was in some sense the pivotal figure in modern Indian drama. In terms of his imaginative stagecraft, which was modeled after Sanskrit aesthetics, that attempted to transform Western theatrical modes of domestic realism and picturesque entertainment. His plays were also controversial for the time because they dealt with issues like female sexuality, the orthodoxies of Hinduism, untouchability, and they also anticipated in many ways environmental concerns and revisited Buddhism as a Pacific faith. What Tagore was also known for was for introducing women to the stage, which was completely unheard of because for the longest time, you only had men performing on stage, either as men or cross-dressing as women. Right? And 
it's because of Tagore that you, you see the first few women, especially those who came from quote unquote respectable families at a time when male actors impersonated women. And so what's also interesting is the conspicuous absence of female playwrights and female actresses on stage. Because uh, the history of Indian theater uh, had largely, if not only, seen uh, men perform on stage. Right? So for the first time, you have women performing on stage as women. Right? And there was a, a, la a large stigma attached to women who performed on stage because the moment a woman was, vis was visible on stage performing, it was seen as uh, a mark of her uh, loose character right? because she suddenly became accessible to the male gaze and it was not something that women from respectable families were expected to do. Right? So it became a problem uh, when women were then introduced on stage. Right? So it's important to then uh, try and understand modern Indian theatre, uh, the early beginnings of modern Indian theatre in terms of uh, the colonial equation of modern Indian theatre to Sanskrit theatre, right? the classical model of Sanskrit theatre and the fact that this, the impact of uh, Sanskrit theatre lasted even well into the post-independence era when uh, some of the early post-independence uh, playwrights and theoreticians and critics still emphasized the impact of Sanskrit theatre on uh, Indian theatre. Right? But on one hand, if on the one hand, uh, Indian practitioners of theatre incorporated these Western colonial um, scholarly accounts of Sanskrit theatre, they also used Indian theatre uh, to uh, agitate against the British, right? because theatre had also become a space for protest, especially towards the mid and the, late, the latter half of the 19th century, right? when Indian theatre became a form of protest. Uh, it was not always possible for Indian uh, theatre practitioners and actors to perform plays that were explicitly against the British state. But uh, there were still ways in which one could indirectly, right, probably through allegories, symbolism, uh, through a certain form of acting uh, and performance, um, insinuate uh, the indignation and, and injustice that the British had uh, perpetuated and meted out onto the native population. Right? So it, it's, it's important to then think of um, uh, how Indian theatre was modelled on certain colonial western idioms of theatrical conventions, but was used precisely in order to actually work against the exploitative uh, policies, the unjust policies of the British state. So one needs to look at modern Indian theatre, especially in its early beginnings, as a site of a paradox, right, where you borrow, you incorporate certain Western models of acting and dramaturgy and performance, and you use those models, those very models, to actually argue and critique uh, colonialism. Right. Thank you. <laughs>